So welcome everybody to Introduction to Kubernetes and to Open Source 101. Glad you're here. Uh, my name is Brent Laster, and I'm going to be doing this extended session. So we'll have a 45-minute session. We'll have, I think, a 15-minute break, then another 45-minute session after that. Uh, so what I'm going to do today, because even in 90 minutes, it's going to be hard to really give you a uh, good introduction to Kubernetes or a solid introduction to Kubernetes beyond just the basics. I'm going to show you lots of slides. I will show you animations and stuff too. I also have some labs and I'll, I'll when we get to the break and come back from the break, I've got some uh, labs that you can do on your own time. They're all interactive. They're, uh, they're browser based or in GitHub and I'll show you how those work as well. So we'll kind of get through the first section, do the break. I'll come back, talk a little bit about the labs and we'll finish out the section from there. Um, just FYI, I am at a little disadvantage, bit of a disadvantage today because usually I can walk around and point and click and everything too, but my uh, clicker isn't working, so I'm going to kind of stay behind the podium and gesture here as well. But uh, let's start out. How many of you worked with containers before? And Docker, pretty much, I guess Docker and containers are going to be pretty much synonymous for most people. How about Kubernetes? Anybody uh, uh, ventured into Kubernetes? All right, no biases, cool. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into the presentation. Let me make sure I've got my uh, slides going here. Now let's try it this way. There we go. Real quick about me, and I won't belabor this, um, I have a training company, Tech Skills Transformation. My day job is as an R&D director in the DevOps organization at SAS in Cary, North Carolina, um, up the road a little bit and uh, do a lot of training, various topics, get Jenkins, Kubernetes, all sorts of things. Uh, articles, opensource.com, have a couple of books I'll mention in just a moment as well, and uh, some uh, small books or reports, they call them, on O'Reilly. Uh, there's information on the bottom, connect with me on social media. If you'd like to reach out and connect, feel free. Always happy to make new connections. This is one of the books I have, Professional Git. Uh, if you know somebody who is interested in learning Git, or even if they've been using Git for a while, it's kind of divided up so you can either do advanced stuff or uh, newbie stuff as well. Check that out, it's on Amazon. Of course, there are lots of free references to Git on the web as well. But if you like the way this class is done, uh, you'll probably like the way the, the book is done as well. Also, there's a Jenkins 2 book, a little bit uh, older now, but still relevant if you're using Jenkins as a CICD, Continuous Integration, Continuous Delivery tool, uh, all about uh, pipelines as code. And we'll talk, uh, we won't talk in this class really about, I'll show you an example of using containers in pipeline or an illustration of it. But when we talk about our CICD pipelines, getting code in, code changes, all the way through building, testing, packaging, delivering out the other side, making it ready for customers in an automated, repeatable fashion. That's what Jenkins does very well, and that's one of the things uh, with covered in that book. If you do are interested in that book, recommend you get the electronic copy. The printed version, unfortunately, has some uh, washed out screenshots. They're kind of hard to look at. I do a lot of training on O'Reilly. Uh, if you're interested in any topics here, or again, if you like the way the class is done, Check out, search for my name on O'Reilly. You'll find uh, quite a few courses there. Also, some different reports on things I've got out there for uh, things around Kubernetes. As a matter of fact, uh, Customize is a tool for orchestrating, managing how we get things running in Kubernetes. Uh, it's one of two primary ones, the other one being Helm, H-E-L-M. Uh, Customize with a K, CICD stuff. Tecton is about writing uh, continuous integration, continuous delivery pipelines with Kubernetes objects. So it's actually doing CICD in Kubernetes. Um, so if you get to a point in your Kubernetes uh, career or your Kubernetes uh, skill levels, you're interested in learning more advanced topics, maybe check some of those out. Uh, also working on a GitHub Actions book. GitHub Actions is the automation platform that GitHub has added in there. This one should be out uh, in a few, well, I guess more like probably July or August now, time frame in there, depending on when I get it finished up. So, I'm, uh, lots of stuff going on. Uh, one more plug, Par sorry, sorry for all this, but I want to make sure I mention this. Open Source 101, uh, Todd and the group are doing, we're doing a day of training in Columbia, uh, South Carolina, April 12th. 
Um, this one doing containers demystified in GitHub Actions. Containers demystified will go into more in depth about containers, how they work more, um, how, how they map into things like the file system, those sort of things. And also uh, talking about some of the different tools besides Docker, there's Podman, there's Builda. There's different things that are out there now as alternatives to Docker to work with containers. So we'll go through some uh, hands-on labs with that. The GitHub Actions one is about the automation platform in GitHub. Uh, if you or anybody you know are interested in that, check that out. I'm not sure if there's a cost associated with that or not. I forgot to ask. Uh, so, but, but maybe you can get more details, I'm sure, from the folks downstairs. All right, let's get into what you came for today. So we're going to spend just a little bit of time talking about containers, um, images, things that make them up, layers, some of the benefits as well. It's hard to do any kind of introduction to Kubernetes without some kind of a background or basic understanding of containers. And we'll keep it kind of at a high level, but I'll show you some slides and animations to help you uh, visualize uh, some of the concepts around this. And if we had more time, we could of course go deeper into it, but we'll talk about that. Then we'll get into Kubernetes itself, and we'll talk about some of the, the main parts of it. The clusters, the sets of machines that are used with Kubernetes to, man to manage containerized workloads. That is, your containers running, but keeping them able to scale and keeping them up and going or restarting them if needed, and making sure that processes can have access to them and so on. So we'll talk about the different objects in there. We'll talk about the behavior of Kubernetes. Uh, debugging, probably not so much this time around. I probably should have taken it off the slide. Again, if we have more time, there's stuff we can get into. What I really want you to come across, my goal for you today, is to feel comfortable coming out of this that you understand Kubernetes and the main objects it has at a high level. You understand how it's designed to work, how you interact with it, uh, and again, kind of at the high level, but as I mentioned, there are a set of labs, a couple of quick labs where you build some containers, you push them out to a Kubernetes cluster, you run your own little cluster, and uh, you can see an application actually up and running. Those are hosted in GitLab, and I'll point you to those uh, after the break. All right, so uh, if I miss a, if you have a question or something, feel free to raise your hand in this uh, dim light. I may not be able to see it, so feel free to yell out Brent or you know throw something or whatever you need to do to get the attention there. Um, I may you know, answer and say, we'll get to that a little bit later, or I might say, let's chat about that during the break or something if we need to, just because some things can get into an extended explanation of that. Uh, also, I do have a hard stop at 1215 because I've got a book signing second floor, I think, for, get, for my Git book, if anybody's interested in that, but I'll have to kind of jet out of here. But I will be happy to talk with you later on um, we can catch up or something, or you can DM me or something, and we can uh, catch up on uh, questions you have. All right? All right, let's jump into it. So what are containers? Well, there's lots of ways to define them, but really the way I think about it, kind of twofold. One way is a standard unit of software um, that functions like a fully provisioned machine. Now that sounds a little funny, standard unit of software. What I mean by that is that when we talk about a container, we're talking about essentially almost like a virtualized machine. It's different from what we call a virtual machine. But the idea is you've got an application in uh, running on this uh, environment that has been partitioned out from operating system resources. So Docker or some other runtime and the pieces associated with it have said, we're gonna take part of the memory, we're gonna take part of process IDs, part of networking, part of other resources, and we are going to dedicate them to this application running in this self-contained or containerized environment. Now that means too that to the application that's running in the container, as far as it's concerned, it's got its own machine to run. It's almost as if you had your own laptop, your own dedicated uh, machine, and you put one application on it, you set up everything to run that one application, and you said, this is all you're going to do, you've got the resources you need, here you go. So one way, or one, the main part about a container is that really there's run times, there's engines, there's pieces that are t focused on <clears throat> Exercise, creating that sort of self-contained environment, that container, which has portions of the operating system's resources from the host machine, the machine that Docker or whatever is running on, to be able to allocate to that application. 
So the other way though that what a container enables really is to have this package, this image uh, with uh, the software and the application already provisioned in it that you can start and run in any kind of environment. I can have an image, for example, that runs a database, uh, Postgres, MySQL or something, that has all the software provisioned in that image. And then I can take that image and I can start up a container in a cloud environment, on my local laptop, in any kind of a VM if I want to. So it is this kind of provisioned system there. It's almost like you had, again, if you think about a dedicated laptop, you put all your machine, all your software on, get everything there for running, and then you can hand it to somebody and they can start using it. Kind of a similar idea. So it has all the software needed to run an application. It's a way of packaging software so the applications, their dependencies have a self-contained environment. Uh, they're insulated from the host OS. Insulated in this sense means that we try to limit what they can do. They can't necessarily reach out and do bad things on the host system. They are containerized or kept in the boundaries there. Now, of course, there are ways to get around that. There are ways that some containers can run as root or get into access to the host systems, but ideally you should prevent that and, and we try to restrict that. Um, easily ported to other environments. And anytime you talk about containers, you're going to see an obligatory picture at some point of a container cargo ship. You just will. Because that's how people, that's what containers people think of as containers, is these uh, actual physical containers that you stuff things in. So what is in a container? Well, if we were to think about it as being like one of these cargo containers, a container as we're describing in software here would have things like the app itself, the runtime, dependencies, the settings, the system library, system tools, anything that you would normally provision on a computer to actually execute and run software, right? So that all gets encapsulated in the container. Now, when you go into, uh, when, but containers are running instances of images. And by images here, the easiest way I can help you think of this probably Think about when you go to provision a computer. Anybody here tech support for their family or had to stage a computer for your family or maybe at work or something, they say, hey, I, would, I need this software. Please go help me set it up, right? I've had to do it a number of times. I had to teach my kids how to do it in any way. But the idea is if you have that list of software, the operating system, maybe it's the productivity apps like Microsoft Office, the antivirus, some stuff they want you to copy that they transfer it onto a USB drive, that kind of thing. You go through and you put that all onto a disk, right, on that machine. And once you provisioned it, once you put it on that disk, even if that machine is turned off, the image is still on that disk, right? The software is still there. It's still configured. If you flip the switch on and start that computer up, it's ready to run. Similar kind of concept with containers. Containers are based off of images. Images are set of provisioned software very much sort of like you've gone through that process of laying down an operating system, copying stuff over, doing those kinds of things in there. That image is still there with all the provision software, configuration, everything there, even if we're not running as a container. But anytime we want to spin up a container, we can grab that image, run it through something like Docker or one of the other tools, and get a container running where we can work. So we talk about, if I can advance my slides, Let's talk a little bit about benefits of containers and why are these things popular? Why do people even care about them? Well, a couple of different ones. So easy to start up. And the, the diagram here is intended to mean that basically we have the host system, some machine that you're running uh, Docker or some other container engine on. And you've got the operating system on here and you've got Docker out there to manage running containers on the system. So it's easy to start up because all I have to do is get an image, a pre-configured image. Maybe it's an image for a database with all the software and op operating system and set up for configuration environment for that database. And these images are stored in container registries or image registries. Uh, Hub.docker.com is the main one. Docker was kind of the first big player in to really make it easy to use containers. So they uh, have a lot of dibs on things, like they have the main image registry. But basically we store images in there and we can go out and we can do like a Docker pool, which would say, go and get me an image 
and put it on the system. And then there's a Docker run command, which says run this image as a container. And I'll talk in a minute about what this actually does or what it does for you. But running an image basically says, hey, start up a container based on this image. Think of it almost like as you turn the computer on, now you've got all the software available to you, you've got a place to work, you can start doing things with it. So it's very easy to start up. I don't have to go through and provision software. Anybody can come along and grab that image and start up a container based on that image. It's very portable to use. Quick, easy rollbacks. Images are versioned. There's a concept in containers talking about images being immutable. Immutable essentially means read only. So when we provision the software, we intend for it to be read only. Think about you install software on your laptop. The, so the operating system, those pieces, you're not typically going out and changing them. They're meant to just be read only. So if we make a change to an image, we create a new version of it. So let's suppose that we get an image out of there. We pull it out, 1.1.0, and we fire up a container with the run command. And then we get a container running, and we find there's a problem with that. All right, so we say, hmm, 1.1.0 version of this image, of this software that's been provisioned in here, has a problem. I, don't, I need to go back, or I need to roll back to a previous one. Well, it can be as easy as going out and pointing back and saying, okay, give me the previous version, previous image, 1.01, and start that one running, and you can be back in business. Now, of course, there can also be other complexities about if you're, you know, written data to places and such as well. But this will actually, this ideal, or this shows you the ideal that you can pick these versioned images and use them as well. Makes it very simple. I don't have to go and reinstall the operating system, reinstall some other software onto uh, the machine. I just pull a different image with a different version of the software. Portability. I can run anywhere without rebuilding as long as I have an engine on there. Again, Docker is the most popular one. I can run it on the cloud. I could run it, run it as uh, an image there in the container. I could run the same image if I have Docker supporting on a virtual machine. A VM is a virtual machine. Or I could run it even on a local machine. Uh, bare metal, I was trying to see what that said. Bare metal just meaning an actual physical machine that you have access to. So anywhere you can run Docker or run one of the container engines, you can run your container. So it makes it very simple and very easy to port. And it supports distributed decoupled architecture. What does that mean? Well, we talk about uh, software today, the microservice model is very popular. This is the idea, instead of building our application as this big monolithic, you know, just a couple of pieces for everything, we split up, up into smaller services or microservices that specialize in one thing. Maybe it's authentication, maybe it's managing the, the database, handling the backup, handling user uh, whatever, logons. Uh, but this model, the microservice model, putting things into smaller pieces in our software lends itself really well to a containerized environment because we're targeting a model or an architecture that says, run this service as the single thing we've got in here really focused on, and then we're going to uh, run a container that just does that one thing. So it makes it very simple to have a container that handles things, you know, maybe it's for running our uh, web application or running our authentication service or uh, having a gateway. You have an image that you create that is targeted for that service, that microservice, that piece of your software, then you fire it up in a container, and then probably you have something like Kubernetes that's going to be able to manage all of those containers and run them for you in the system. So this kind of distributed uh, microservice sort of model where you're splitting up your software and these components fits very well into a containerized uh, model. Uh, agility. Containers are well suited for a specific task. You can spin them up to address needs. So an example here would be what we call like a DevOps workflow, meaning basically a continuous integration delivery pipeline, an automated repeatable set of processes intended to take source code changes and put them through build, test, all those things to package and deliver out the other side, ready for a customer to consume. So think about you have a cloud environment 
and you want to spin up a pipeline. So we've got uh, Docker, again, some other engine there. We've got a repo with some data uh, where we're going to put our product code. We've got a registry with images, and images here might be things like Gradle. Gradle is a build tool um, that, that's used, JUnit, uh, for some of the testing pieces and so on. So what we can do, for example, is when we're ready to run this, we can simply say uh, when a source code change is, detect is detected and our pipeline kicks off, grab a Gradle 5 image, spin us up an instance of Gradle 5 so we can build this stuff in a container, take the source code, build it, get rid of the container. Why would you get rid of it? Think about this, your cloud cost, right? Cloud, running things in the cloud can be expensive. If you don't need to have it running all the time, you don't have to. Spin up the container, do your business, write the files out to a disk somewhere, spin down the container, save the resources. Likewise, we go into the unit framework. We might spin up a container for JUnit for testing. Uh, might spin up one for packaging, whatever the packaging tool is, and so on. Obviously, very simple thing. Now, the cool, other cool thing about this is, let's suppose that they say, hey, you know what, Gradle 6 has come out. It's been out for a while, but Gradle 6 has come out, and we want to change our pipeline to use Gradle 6. Okay. Cool. Well, one of the things we can do is simply change where we get our image from, which image we're getting, right? Just like we saw when we rolled rollback, you can go out and get an image that says Gradle 6. There's probably, I'm sure there's one on Docker Hub, and you could pull it, and by the way, you could have your registries internal to your company or to your project, however you want, you can set up your own registries. Gradle 6, will pull that image, and now, next time around, we'll spin up a Gradle 6 builder, a container with Gradle 6, build it with Gradle 6, and go on our way. So it makes it very easy. You're changing definitions. You're changing definition. And this is where we get into the larger concepts like pipelines as code, because I can simply say, I want to go build, pull down a Gradle 5 image from a registry, start that up with the Docker run, so we can code up our pipeline. We can make it very easy to do. We don't have to touch installing any software. We just say, hey, go get this container, this image that's already got all the software provision, spin it up, run the thing, throw it away, or get rid of it. So it makes it very easy to do the, that sort of uh, updates and that sort of simple spin up, spin down, which again can help you in things like saving with your cloud cost. Uh, container images and layers. We'll just take a quick, uh, quick little explanation into what makes up some of the containers and things in there. So I'm going to start this running. I know it's going to be probably impossible for you to read from there, but basically what we've got over here on the left-hand side is what we call a Docker file. And a Docker file for Docker is the set of software that we want to put into the image and the configuration we want to do. So it is things like, get me a base image. That's where we have special commands like from, copy things in, and so on, and pull it down. So there's a set of instructions, almost as if somebody handed you a checklist and said, hey, Brent, please go put on this operating system onto this machine for me. Go copy these files in. I really I want it to look like this. And so what happens is in the case of like the from, I say from MySQL, very old image, 5.45, 5 what happens is that reaches out to the Docker Hub by default, the registry, and says go and grab all the things that make up that MySQL 5.545 image. Now, what, how did that image get there? At some point in the past, someone went through and they created a, they laid down an operating system, they set up a MySQL, they copied in some stuff. Each one of those essentially created what we call a layer. So what you're seeing these pull completes, it's saying I'm grabbing the layer from the registry, pulling it down, and then <clears throat> I'm going to go through, get all the pieces that make up the base MySQL part of it, and then I'm going to copy in some stuff, and I'm going to set some uh, entry points and CMD. These are things that tell the container what to start up when it runs. But the point is that effectively, when we go through this Docker file, we are grabbing each command or each command, and it is essentially creating a layer. Not every command will create a layer. It doesn't work that way not these days. It used to be that. <clears throat> They've gotten more efficient about it, but for our purposes, we can uh, visualize it that way. So every command in our Docker file is like a step you do towards building up that image you want. And then that creates a layer. 
You can see down there on the bottom, the layers are coming up. And then it actually goes through and creates that set of layers. And that actually becomes then our image. So this becomes then my MySQL image. I want a database and I want it to be populated with some startup scripts and I want it to run a certain thing. So I've just leveraged another image in there. And if you're wondering what all this is on the left-hand side, this is a Docker history command. Again, I know it's not uh, able to see that, but basically it says what went into this. And if you were able to read this, this whole kind of blue or lavender section here are all the steps that somebody went through to create that MySQL image, that one that we started with. There's things like um, do an add, uh, run, copy some stuff in here, set up some environment variables, and so forth. So containers, images, they're not really that mysterious. They're really just more of a section of software. Yes, sir? So the question was, are these all running Alpine Linux? And let me break that down a little bit for folks who aren't familiar with that. When you talk about an image in Docker and you talk about running a container, at the core, they all have an operating system piece that they're running. Normally, it could be Bash, could be Ubuntu, I mean, something with Bash, it could be Ubuntu, Debian, whatever, you know, uh, specific flavors of things. Alpine Linux is one that is a very minimal uh, operating system image. What Alpine is, is it actually has anything that they think doesn't need to be run in a container or because you don't have a user interface stripped out of it. So like a shell, right? <laughs> but they're like, well, we don't need a shell because you're not going to be interacting with this like you would in a command terminal or something most of the time. So Alpine is designed to strip out most of those components from it to make a very, very small image because as you start stacking more stuff into images, the size starts to matter there because you get downloading, compressing, all those kinds of things. So to answer your question, um, I don't think most of them are based off of Alpine. Certainly, if there is, a, there is a, a lot of them that are based off of things, Alpine or things like it, which are very stripped down operating systems without any user interface pieces. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So layers and disk storage. Again, um, it kind of just gives you the visualization of it. If this was our Docker file with the different uh, steps in it we're going to go through, then when we go to pull something from the image registry, it might go out from MySQL 5.5.45. The from means go get it from a registry, pull it out of there. We get that image out. We saw that that image, that single MySQL image, still had bunches of layers in it. Bunches, lots of layers in it. Uh, if we think about them as like these platters. When we get those, ultimately, if you're using Docker, those get stored in a location on your operating system, var live docker. Now you don't have to know all of this to understand to use containers, but I like to kind of map it back to what's happening on the system to kind of uh, give you the full view. So we can put those images there, or sorry, those layers in there, and really they're housed as directories. They're just directories underneath an area there, var live docker, and they're directories with changes. If I copied a file in, that, let that uh, directory would have that file in there, whereas the previous one wouldn't. So it's essentially like a set of directories, and that's, a, that's an oversimplification. But that kind of makes up our set of things from MySQL. The next command is to copy things in. So maybe I copy things and create a layer off of that and store that out there. So each layer then has an ID. So the different layers, the different things with the different changes we've made, uh, get stored out in that var live docker area and uh, get stored out there for us to use. Now, when we have the layers stored out there, then we have pieces of the runtimes or pieces of like the container engines, like uh, Docker, which have a storage driver, which are responsible for doing things like saying, how do I map all of these layers to an actual image, to a set of software that we want to run for our container? So if I then go and do a, or if I go and actually do a Docker build, in there, then it will create an image. And essentially an image is just a set of pointers 
mm, two layers in there. So basically what it's doing, it's just saying, hey, you had these four steps in here, they each made up these layers, I'm gonna create your image, and it's gonna have pointers to these layers in the operating system in there. So really what the storage drivers and the Docker and those kinds of things are doing, they're looking at all the layers here and they're mapping them into the image you want. That's how when you start up an image, that's how it has a set of software because those different layers with the different changes have been stored in, this, in the operating system. Now going to containers, let's suppose I had two images out here. And I'll point out that the layers can be the same layers between them. Remember that I mentioned that word immutable that said read only? This is a key part of the functionality. These images are not designed to be changed in there, the layers, once you created them. So that means I can point multiple images to the same layers. I can reuse layers across images. I can add some more in there, but I can create images based off of the different layers that it's stored out in that Docker area. And I can do a Docker, Docker run is the command to create an actual container. Now what does a container do? Well, really what a container is versus an image, a container is just a very thin, uh, smallish, read-write layer that gets put, attached to an image. So it's another layer that just points to an image. Now the, I can run an image too, I could create a container off of that. Now here's the cool thing, I can actually run another one off of image one, and I can have another container that uses the same image. Because this software in the image is immutable, read only, I can have multiple containers very easily spun up from that and pointing to the same image. So I don't have to re-download copies of layers. Now, what is this layer here? It's basically your workspace. It's like a read-write area. If you think about it from the standpoint of our laptop analogy, this would be like your user area. Or if you, you get into like a home directory, a user directory, that kind of thing, it's the area you can write files in, you can make changes in, right? So it's that area you can play with. So that's really all containers, well, all, but that's what containers are. Containers just give you this space, your space, your thin read-write layer to work with this, okay? Now again, this is where your application is running and doing things. You're not typically getting in there and doing things with it, but that's the space for your application to work. But similar to the home directory, user directory, that kind of thing. So that's the basic idea of sort of containers, images, and layers in there. One more quick note, um, there are standards about how tooling engines and such work with containers. Docker was really the first one to really uh, provide an easy to use interface to containers. Container technology has been around in Linux for a long time. There was something called LXC, Linux Container Technology, which was able to say, segment part of the system resources for this application, segment this piece for this, for this, for this application to run, and so on. What Docker did was they put a nice interface on it. They defined a standard, a way of saying, this is how things should be stacked together, for example, with the layers. This is a command line interface you can use to create containers, images, and all that they put the nice wrapping around it that made it really easy and accessible in there. But the technology itself has been around for a long time. But at some point, uh, Docker got with the uh, Linux Foundation. Uh, Linux Foundation does a lot of open source things, obviously. Uh, but Linux Foundation and said, hey, we are going to give you the standards, the various um, ways that we put things together and all the pieces there. So they have actually given that to the Linux Foundation. The Linux Foundation has published it, which means there's this OCI, Open Container Initiative, which essentially means if you follow the OCI spec, you too can be like Docker. You can do things like Docker. And so now we have applications like Podman, P-O-D-M-A-N, uh, put out by Red Hat, which is very similar to Docker, plus it has some things around pods, which we talk about in Kubernetes, and other tools as well. But we have this open container initiative spec there. So Docker is not the only game in town anymore. In fact, it's kind of um, losing, I guess, some of its share out there uh, in things, but there's a lot now that are based off of the OCI spec. 
All right, so in summary, how do we think about these things? Well, consider the analogy of installing software on a machine. You heard me say this before, but just to kind of put it into a single picture. If I talk about a provisioning a new system, then I have a blank system and maybe I go through and install software. I put the operating system on it, I put productivity software, you know, the antivirus, whatever. Then once I've created that set of software provisioned and configured on that disk, I can take an image of that disk and save it off, right? I could put it on a uh, USB drive if it would fit or an external hard disk or store it on a network somewhere. And then if I wanted to, I could come back and I could create a new system, a new uh, piece here, based off of that image, just by copying that image over and there. And I could also then, if I w go in and add a user on there, and the user space would have areas to work in, write files, and so on. Likewise, I could do it on another system, right? Take a copy of that same image, spin up something, create a user space on there. So you can think of the idea of these images, the sets of provisioned software, I'm not saying it's exactly the same thing, but to give you the analogy of being like a Docker image, because a Docker image really is that set of provisioned software. It has a base, uh, has operating system and other pieces. Yes, sir? So if these images don't know about the operating system, what if you have an image that asks for more resources than you or something like that? Is right. That enough, or how does the configure for here adjust? So good question. So the question was, if the, if the images don't know about the host operating system, and I'll make differ differentiation the op versus the operating system inside the image versus the one where the machine it's running on. What if it needs more resources in there and needs that? Uh, typically, a best practice is to sort of declare your limits, declare what you expect it to use in there. Um, you can get into challenges if you don't set up something like that, put up guardrails around it. Uh, now, one of the things that you can, when we get into Kubernetes, Kubernetes, that's part of what it does, is to look at that and say, you, you, I expect you to use only this much memory. You've all of a sudden shot up, something's going wrong. You've used, you are consuming most of the memory on the actual system running in Kubernetes. And so I'm gonna shut you down. <laughs> I'm gonna restart you. So that's where you get into these kinds of applications that do that. But typically a best case would be that you would specify sort of upfront what you expect it to be, what you expect it to use. And we get into Kubernetes, we talk about, um, uh, limits and the, the how much you expect to use and how much you're actually allowed to use. But Kubernetes will will try to maintain the integrity of the system. In other words, it will say if any one application starts going rogue and starts using too much stuff, we're going to shut it down and restart it. Okay. All right. I see we're at 10 after. I know we're supposed to have like about a 15-minute uh, break. Uh, would you guys be willing to settle for like a 10 minute break now and then we come back and launch into Kubernetes pieces? Does that work? All right. Let's do a 10 minute break. Uh, we'll start off about 20 after, I think, uh, here maybe. And then we'll come back and uh, talk about Kubernetes now that we've got containers. Okay. All right, guys, let's get started again. Um, I mentioned some labs, so I want to give you a real quick sort of thing. If you want to do this, this is optional. You don't have to do it during the class, because like you can be listening here. But if you want something out of the class, after the class to play with, um, if you have a GitHub ID, if you don't, sign up for GitHub ID. They're free. But you sign up for GitHub ID, and if you go to um, github.com, and I'll put this up at the end of class so you can see it better. Um, actually, maybe I can make this even a little bigger here, github.com, and then skill docs, S-K-I-L-L-D-O-C-S. -L -L uh, then there is a, there's a lot out there. This is one, I, I teach a lot of classes, so this is one, but there's one for K-I-N-T, for short for Kubernetes Introduction, K-I-N-T. So if you log on to your GitHub account and you go to github.com slash skill docs, with an S, slash K-I-N-T, there is a little, um, well, all right, there is, <laughs> what did, oh, skill repos, geez. All right, sorry guys, I've got multiple organizations. This one has docs and code. Usually I separate the docs and code. Don't go to there. Skill repos, sorry, R-E-P-O-S. 
Let's try that one. There we go. Yay. Skill repose slash K-I-N-T, if you're interested. Now, to what I've got out here, what I put together was just a um, couple introduction to Kubernetes, a couple of quick labs that'll be creating, basically tells you how to go about creating your own fork copy of the repository and clicking a code space, creating a code space, and then you can start up, do some Docker, build a couple of Docker images for a very little toy app I have that has a web app and a database, and you get to deploy it in Kubernetes. There's an instance called Minikube out there. I'll show you real quick kind of what this looks like. I won't take too much time because I want to get back to this. Uh, basically, when you go to here, if I can, let me sh shrink this down a little bit so we can get it on the screen here. Uh, there's a fork button. If you're not familiar with Kubernetes, uh, GitHub, fork. What forking does is it allows you to, if I hit it right there, come on. Oh yeah, there we go. Create a new fork. So it's gonna create a copy of my repository in your GitHub space. That's what it does. It creates a copy of my repository in your GitHub space because you wanna have your own copy to play with and you don't wanna be changing what I've got out there. So it'll give you, it's like in this case, I'm logged in as GW student to two. And we'll go ahead and create the fork. And then we'll go and it'll say, hey, I'm forking it, which means it's creating a copy in your space. And then there's a readme file in here, actually, if you just scroll down, that gives you all these directions, okay? It will it'll guide you through this. It has things like the fork button. And then it says, configure a code space. Well, what's a code space? And it has the directions, but I'll just show you here real quickly. Cool thing in GitHub, I can create a new working area right in the browser with code spaces. And it'll take a second to pop up, but then I've got a terminal. I've got the files over here. It'll have the files downloaded uh, or already downloaded onto the system once it spins up. And then you can just go through and follow through. Uh, you can look at the, the readme. Actually, let's do the preview of the readme. Uh, oops. Sorry, I'm trying to talk and do this at the same time. Yeah, so there's the preview of the readme, which kind of gets you to this point and then directs you to the labs document, which will open up as here, markdown. And it just takes you a couple of, through a couple of simple labs. Again, building um, some images. You can just type in here. There's a little instance of a single node Kubernetes cluster, Minikube, and this guides you through it in the lab, so you can start that up. You have a little Minikube instance to run. It'll set up and download that. You can type in here and just follow along with the labs. You can copy and paste and so forth. So if you're interested after the class in playing with that, again, it's at uh, github.com skill repos, R-E-P-O-S, S-K-I-L, R-E-P-O-S, uh, slash K-I-N-T for Kubernetes introduction. All you need is a browser and a GitHub ID, and you can play with uh, single node Kubernetes if you want. So, uh, yeah, have fun with that if you're interested. Let's go ahead, jump back to our presentation. And that'll run for a while, but we'll go ahead. No, let's see. All right, let's launch into discussion on Kubernetes. I missed my pointer. All right, so what is Kubernetes? So, Kubernetes. Uh, PR term here, right? Fan, uh, portable, extensible platform for managing containerized workloads and services. Basically, it is a way to manage all those containers that you need to run for an application. You remember that, that slide I showed you, like the microservice sort of architecture there in different container for each one? Well, imagine trying to keep all of those running. Imagine trying to keep everything going. Imagine trying to make sure those all get uh, up and running on an appropriate machine and all of the kinds of things. As you get more and more containers, it becomes more and more challenging to manage all of those. So Kubernetes is designed to help with that. It comes from the Greek for helmsman, thus the icon, the ship's wheel, frequently abbreviated as Kates. Now, this is one of the funny things when you start getting into Kubernetes, you hear people talking about Kates this and Kates, uh, Kates specs and Kates this, and you think, who's this person named Kates? Kates is K8S, I've literally heard that. K8S is an abbreviation for the K and the S at the beginning and the end and the eight letters in between. They, this is one of those kind of trendy things to do now in some of the circles. Um, I think my favorite is uh, the observability. They abbreviate it as O11Y, 
which is, they call Ollie, looks like O-L-L-Y. So anyway, Cates, if you hear Cates, they're talking about Kubernetes. Formerly known as Borg, started out as, Kubernetes, as a, a Google project, uh, and probably any of you who are familiar with Star Trek know what Borg was, but open source by Google in 2014. Basically, it groups containers together into things we'll call pods. Um, and then the goal is to provide a robust platform for running lots of containers, doing automated deployment, framework, takes care of scaling, failover, deployment, all the kinds of things you don't want to have to do by hand. So how do we think about this? The best analogy I could come up with, a data center for containers. If you think about what a data center does, uh, Google Data Center, or maybe you have one in your own company, then they, if for computers, for the different hardware systems, they do things like uh, provide systems to service a need, right? Somebody says, we're, hey, we're doing a new application for customers. We want you to set up machines for that, okay? Keep it up and running. You gotta have it up most of the time. Keep it going, keep it able to service the request. Add more, scale them up, depending on load. Uh, think about the idea of like, you know, in the U.S. we have the Christmas holidays. Uh, prior to that, right, we, people will typically start ordering lots of stuff, more activity going to different sites. So sites may scale up. They may need more systems to actually handle the load in the cloud. After the holidays, they probably want to scale back down. They don't want to keep paying for those systems. They want to scale it back down. So being able to scale the number of systems dedicated to an application to handle the load. Deal with systems that are having problems. You know, if a computer is having problems, you've got to take it out of the mix, you've got to replace it, or something along those lines. Not so much about fixing or restaging these days. It's like just pull it out, put it in there. Uh, deploy new systems when needed and provide simple access to pools of systems, et cetera. Kind of the kind of ideas, the things that a data center does in this way is what Kubernetes does for containerized workloads. It's everywhere. There were a couple of other contenders early on, things like Docker Swarm, uh, Mesos was another one out there. Kubernetes has just emerged to win the day. It's not necessarily the simplest to use, but it is the, um, the, it is the one that provides the most value, the one the communities have embraced, uh, industries have embraced, as evidenced by the fact that it has uh, Kubernetes applications or ways you can spin up Kubernetes clusters really easily on any kind of cloud environment, whether it be Amazon, which has the EKS, Elastic Kubernetes Service. Google has their Google Container uh, Engine, GKE. Azure has Azure Kubernetes Services, AKS. And even things like uh, OpenShift. Anybody heard of OpenShift? Yeah. OpenShift is Red Hat's offering into the Kubernetes mix. It's essentially Kubernetes with some Red Hat goodness on top of it. Um, in terms of uh, managing some things in there. But OpenShift is intended more for an on-prem or more platform. There are versions for the clouds as well. Point of this is Kubernetes has won the war as far as container orchestration. It's where the industry is and is what they're using. And uh, it's what you'll run into today. So Kubernetes features, and we'll go through some of these. Um, Service discovery, load balancing in there, figuring out what's running in the system, being able to discover the pieces uh, there and being able to balance uh, network traffic coming through, for example, and things. Rollouts and rollbacks. Um, Kubernetes, for example, if you have a version of your container um, that is out there and you need to put out a new one, well, a version of your image, I should say, and you need to put out a new version of your image, one of the things you can do with Kubernetes, you can tell Kubernetes, hey, I want to, everything that was running my old version of my image, I want it to run the new version. So you tell that to Kubernetes, and basically Kubernetes kills off all the old ones and starts up new ones, okay? So it just says, okay, fine, yeah, I'll start up new ones for you and kill it off. That does mean, and I'll just mention this briefly here, that does mean that you have to be, uh, have your applications in Kubernetes be designed to be what we call stateless. Now what stateless means is that if I kill off an instance of your application and I start a new instance, that new instance should be able to pick up where the old one left off, all right? I'll give you an example. Talking about database, we used a database example earlier. If I, as an application, if I am, uh, have a database thing running in Kubernetes, and let's say that the container goes rogue and starts using up too much memory or system resources, Kubernetes says, uh-uh, you're not putting the rest of the system in jeopardy, I'm gonna kill you off and I'm gonna start up a new instance, that new instance needs to know how to pick up from whatever was you, whatever queries were being done, whatever was being done before. How do you do that? 
best practices like you write your data out every so often to something outside of the container, outside of the system, right? You write your data out and you have your application designed to go and look at that location when it starts up. So I have one instance that's running, writing its data out every so far as it, get, it makes progress. Kubernetes says, nope, you're, you're gonna be killed off or maybe you wrote a new version of your image. Either way, the current container gets killed, the new one starts up, the new one should be able to say, I should go look based on uh, configuration or something, go off and look at this location, read in that data and pick up what the other one left off. Otherwise, you get into really weird stuff because all of a sudden your data is gone, you don't know how to recover, you don't know how to, where you left off with it. So you have to keep in mind that Kubernetes, your, app, your container can be running and can be killed off at any point in time because it's being restarted in there. So you need to make it stateless. Um, different things, scaling. Bin packing refers to the idea that Kubernetes can fit as many containers as reasonable into a machine, onto a node that's running it. So it can say, I've got this much memory, this much CPU on one of my nodes. I can fit this container, this container, this container in there, but not others. That's kind of what that means. So it's efficient in that way too. So some quick terminology, and we're going to talk about most of these in a few minutes. Cluster is simply the set of computers that make up a Kubernetes uh, system. It can be a virtual machines, it can be actual physical machines. It's a set of things that are connected, usually a master, a master and node relationship, working nodes. Pods are wrappers around containers. Pods are basically uh, wrappers around one or more containers. They're kind of the lowest level that Kubernetes works with things. Now, if you think of one way to think about it, do you remember the Docker uh, picture with the mascot of the whale? The Docker mascot is the whale with the container on its back. Well, what do you call a group of whales? A pod, right, so pod is a group of containers. Um, it, can have, it can have storage and other things inside there as well. The service, the idea is a service gives you a virtual IP. It gives you an address, a single IP address that you can talk to and then on the back end, the service will send traffic to different pods. So rather than you having to connect up to the particular IP address of a pod to talk and do work, you have a service. And the service then puts the traffic out there. Kind of like a load balancer kind of thing that's one kind of service, uh, distributing the traffic there. A deployment is basically saying, I want you to always, Kubernetes, Kubernetes, I want you to always have at least two instances of my pod running, or five instances, or 10. So a deployment takes care of saying, you should always have this many instances of a pod running. Its job is if it ever drops below, if something happens to a pod, for example, or it gets killed off, it should spin up another one automatically. So it's that kind of, a, kind of like the data center operator, if there was a person who said, oh, wait a minute, we're supposed to have 10 of those machines running, machine number nine is down, all right, I better go kill it put, and get a new one running that sort of idea. Deployment, they sometimes call it like a pod supervisor. Ingress allows cluster applications to be exposed to traffic coming in, and uh, namespace is a logical area to group things together. So, terminology, and the points up here, cluster again, set of computers, set up to work as a unit, um, different abstractions in there, automated distribution and so on. So let's talk about what a cluster looks like. I do not expect you to get all of this. Uh, I will make a PDF of the slides available to you at some point where I, either on the OS 101 side or on SlideShare or something. So to give you an idea of what a cluster, how it works, how Kubernetes works really, we have a master node and a worker, worker nodes. You can have, they could be the same node like in Minikube, that's just a one node server cluster. Or you could have uh, multiple machines out there. So on the master, we have, in the hard to read green box, API server. Kubernetes uh, has, a, you talk to it through a command line tool called kubectl. Now I call it kubectl. I've also heard it called kubectl, kubectl, uh, kubectl, and my favorite, kubectl. So, you know, pick your, pick your poison. Um, I say kubectl, but anyway, basically kubectl is the command line interface to Kubernetes. It has a config file. You often hear it referred to as the cube config file. Everything in cube is, is with a K, cube config file. The cube conf config file says basically, here's the cluster you should work with. Here's where your commands are gonna go. Here's where you do stuff. So the cube config file tells it what cluster to work with. 
So as a user, I feed in commands through the kubectl command line to the API server. Now on the worker nodes, there's a little thing called kubelet. Kubelet's basically the agent. It's the agent on the node that says, I am a Kubernetes node and I know how to talk to the server. So kubelet, or API, the master says, kubelet, I got some work for you to do. The user is asked to have these pods set up this way with these images, with these ports, and so on. Kubelet says, okay, we'll take care of that in a moment. But there's also a couple other things going on. There is an etcd. Etcd is basically like a data store, just storing settings and stuff. And then there is a controller manager. Controller manager, um, in Kubernetes, we have this idea of controllers. Controllers are basically like loops, which sit there and say, you asked me for this. I need to make sure you have this running in the cluster. So the controller is basically trying to say, you know, this is the requirements you gave me. I want to make sure that you have this running in the cluster. So the controller manager manages different types of controllers. Now we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But the, uh, there's also a scheduler. Guess what the scheduler does? Schedules, right? It takes care of scheduling the workloads that you ask for onto the appropriate node. You know, I was talking to someone before and they said, what about if you need like a graphical processing unit? You can have a node that has a GPU on it and you can actually steer work towards that. Really what's happening though at the lower levels is Kubernetes is calling these container runtimes. Now, earlier, previous earlier iterations of Kubernetes, they just called Docker. They just called Docker to do the work. At some point they said, we don't need all the overhead of Docker. We're just going to strip it down and we're going to create our own pieces as well. So there's things CRI and CRIO and Run C. Those are just things that handle creating containers. Uh, Docker depends on some of that too, but basically they stripped out the parts of Docker they didn't need, wrote some of the pieces they wanted to replace and put it in there. But really what it boils down to, go and get an image, spin up a container, wrap it in a pod, you know, spin up more pods. Pods are just wrappers around containers with maybe some storage in there or something like that. Same thing on other nodes. We fire it up and we have different pods running on the nodes. And then there's one more piece here, or a couple more pieces, Cube Proxy. What does that mean? It's basically a way for users to connect directly into the nodes, to talk to the containers running on there. So it's a way to connect into that. And then over there's a thing called uh, the Container Network Interface, make sure I say that right, which is basically the part that runs across Kubernetes to say things can talk to each other. Uh, they call it CNI. It has, I call it fabric names, uh, like Weave or Calico or Flannel, if you hear those kinds of terms. It's talking about that layer of container, the interface there. So that's the quick overview of the cluster. Yes, sir? So services are just groups of pods on worker nodes? Services are essentially groups of pods uh, that, are back, uh, that are a back end for, sorry, service is a virtual interface. It has a single IP address and it selects pods to interact with, and then it sends traffic to those pods on the back end. And usually they're on the same node. Usually, yeah. Uh, pods themselves, pods, here's a couple of pods. The smallest deployable unit in Kubernetes, one or more containers, any shared resources. resources. Uh, they can have a shared storage, which is what that little green box is. Now, Again, if you write something in, if you were to use just the storage inside the container, like your database application, then if your container goes away, yeah, you've lost that data. If you, if you write it on the pod storage, you're slightly better off. If your container goes away, the storage is still there, assuming the pod's still good. But then you get into the thing, what if the pod goes away? So again, designing your applications to be stateless, that is to write their data out somewhere, their state out somewhere, so that if a new instance comes up outside of the pod, write the data outside the pod, then that will put you in good place for that. So pods can be scheduled or scheduled on nodes by the scheduler process. Scheduler comes in, says, hey, we're gonna put you on a Kubernetes node, running in there, and you have your pods. Nodes in the same pod can also talk to each other over localhost. In other words, they don't have to have any more sophisticated networking than that, They can, if you know what localhost is. The point of this is there may be valid reasons to schedule containers in the same pod or not to put them in the same pod depending on what you're trying to do. If they're in the same pod and the pod goes down, you've lost both containers. But if you want to have quick access between things like talking over local host or temporarily sharing storage, it may make sense to put them <clears throat> in the same pod. 
put multiple containers in there. <coughs> uh, yeah, so you just have to decide how you want to schedule them in there. And there's a selector functionality which says I can say I want you to put me on a node with a certain type of hardware, certain characteristics, or so on. So how are containers organized on Kubernetes? Kubernetes clusters have nodes. The nodes then, uh, the master node has API server and scheduler. <clears throat> and basically, it calls out to Kubelet. And you pass specs or manifests. We'll talk more about what these are in a minute. These are the text files that describe the items and how you want them for Kubernetes to create that describes the deployment and what image it should be based on, what ports should be exposed. They're just text files, YAML files. You feed that to that through running the cube CTL command line. The API server says, all right, Kubelet, go out there. They want a container in a pod based off of this image. Grab the images, containers created from images. Spin up the pod, pods wrap containers. Pods are scaled by a deployment. A deployment object we create in Kubernetes says, hey, you are supposed to have three of these. So I'm going to create three instances of the pod to run. On there. Then a service is a front end to that. So we have a service that has a single IP address that we can always connect to. So we can, on the back end, it can send traffic to any of those pods. The nice thing about that is if the pod goes away, we don't care. The server, we just still connect to the service. The service insulates us from having to talk directly to one of those pods. And then the user can come in through that. Namespaces are just groupings of things into a particular area of the cluster. A namespace might be for a project or a team or a customer to group together instances of that. Speaking of namespaces, a couple of points about that. Working area within a cluster, they partition the cluster's resources. Resources are associated or scoped to a namespace. All that means is that the namespace becomes part of the name of the object. They're contained within that namespace. If I have a namespace called foo and a deployment called brent, I've got a foo brent deployment. If I have a namespace called bar and a deployment called brent, I've got a bar brent deployment. Two deployments named brent, but they're in different namespaces, so they can be distinguished by a customer, project, whatever. <coughs> so we can have multiple namespaces here, like my namespace one, my ns1, my ns2. Namespaces can also have quotas. So this is a way you can restrict how much a customer, for example, can use of your system. How much CPU, how much memory are they allocated to work with? Um, all resources in namespace must be unique. So the K here, the git pods, this is running the K as an alias for kubectl. This is running the command line. Uh, but get the pods in the namespace minus one, and we get a pod definition back. The git is just like a list command. And then if I want, I can also get pods in the other one as well. I could uh, also get them from deployments and such. So this is an example of running the command line, like kubectl, some action, and then the objects you're looking for, the dash n limits it to a namespace there. So we have then, we can also just do one namespace. If I had one namespace, then if I said get the SVC, SVC is short for services. It's an abbreviation. Kubernetes has abbreviations for everything. So I can do the services here, and it can say get the services from that are on here, service information. You can see things like the IP, external IP, if it has it, ports that are open, and so on. So I can have everything in one namespace, and then I could have uh, all the pods listed there. So namespaces give you that grouping functionality. And if I say get pods, then all my pods are in that single namespace. So you can have as many namespaces as are reasonable as you want. You can have quotas in there. The default namespace is called default. Surprise, surprise. You can, um, you can specify a different one to be default if you want to through setting a context. But normally on the command line, you just pass a dash n, and that will specify uh, which namespace you want. So defining a Kubernetes object, and I apologize, this is hard to read. Uh, there's a lot of words on here, but let me just for the sake of time kind of talk you through this. A couple of things. This, these are written in YAML. Anybody know YAML? Yeah, if you're, yeah, you're going to have to learn it if you don't because lots of things are in YAML. YAML is yet another markup language. It is all about uh, expressing ownership and in things through like indenting. So things that are indented here and you have to use spaces. Do not use tabs. Use spaces and that 
means that the further they're indented, it implies this kind of ownership relation in there. But in this case, when you create an object in Kubernetes, there's a couple of things you put in there. First thing, API version. Kubernetes has versions of APIs, things like uh, extensions here. And they generally go like V1 alpha, V1 beta, V1, V2 alpha, V2 beta, so on, V2. So there's versions and families of APIs. You have to tell Kubernetes what version you're working with. And they do change. Kubernetes releases probably three or four times, I guess four times a year now, three times a year. There's a kind definition, the kind of Kubernetes object you want, deployment, service, whatever. Metadata, name, labels. Labels is a key value pair there. Uh, namespace, namespace you want it to run in. If you need it to run in, if you want to specify that here, you can't specify the command line. And then there's the spec. So every object will have API version, kind, metadata. Metadata is like name, labels, and so on. The spec part is particular to the kind of object. In a deployment case, you say, I want like one replica. How many replicas do I want? How many copies of that pod do I want running? And then we can also have labels for that. Now this deployments are unusual. They have a spec within a spec. But the lower level spec, I said I want one instant, one pod running, is the spec for the container. And if I get out of the way, maybe you can see it better. The container here says, I want to create a container with the name based off of an image. This is the same image that we talked about with containers. In this case, localhost 5000, that's just a way to specify it. It's the same image you create with Docker or anything. It's the same image. We're just telling Kubernetes, grab this image, spin it up as a container. Maybe there's some things like ports and stuff to expose, and then get that running. Have one instance running all the time. Then at the lower level, there's a service. So we have, uh, that's another kind of object in Kubernetes. Same sort of format though. There's an API version, a kind service, metadata section with name or labels, and then the spec for a service. The spec for a service is the service type and any ports that we want to have open in there as well. So standard format in YAML uh, for different definition types. So Kubernetes is a desired state system. Basically what that means is the user supplies this desired state. The user says, I want one of these or two of these that look like this, and it puts it in those manifests, the YAML files, feeds it to Kubernetes. Kubernetes then runs its controller loop effectively to say, you asked for this state, I'm going to make sure you get that. So I'm going to spin up instances of things in Kubernetes. That's that controller loop. It's reconciling. So this is the thing about Kubernetes. We talk about it being uh, the declarative model versus traditional imperative. What does that mean? Well, I'll give you an analogy to think about that. Let's say that it's getting late in the evening, you've got company, your family's home, you, it's imperative you feed them food, right? You need to fix dinner for them. So, or you need to get them eating at least. Two ways to go about it. The imperative model would say, I go into the kitchen, I get out the recipe book, I get all the ingredients, I go through all the cutting, chopping, I follow the steps, I go through the process, I do everything myself, provide the food. The declarative model would be more like, you know, I say, mm, not feeling it tonight, gonna, let's go out to a restaurant. So we can take them out to a restaurant, the server comes up, you declare what you want, right? From the menu, you say, I want two of these, I want one of this, I want it cooked like this, I want these sides, I want this drink. The server writes it down, takes it back to the kitchen, kitchen prepares it, server brings it to you. You didn't have to go through all the steps to do that. You didn't have to go through the programming. You just declared what you wanted and the server brought it to you. More to the point, if something isn't right, something's wrong with the food, wrong thing comes out, Server takes care of it, right? Come over, they bring, go back to the kitchen, bring you out something that, that does make it right. So the, Kubernetes is like the kitchen in that model. You declare what you want, the kinds of objects you want, Kubernetes spins them up and makes sure they run. And make sure they're there for you. Uh, there's a lot of words on this that would take us too long to go through now. The idea here with labels. Labels are ways to select objects in Kubernetes. A label is simply a key value pair like, uh, it's hard to see here, uh, let's see, labels, current, version, app, roar, version new, version current. So these are labels you can put on nodes, you can put on pods, put on anything in Kubernetes. And then you can say, I want the thing whose label is uh, version equals current, or I want the thing whose version is app equals roar, in this case. So you can select that. And so this gives you a lot of power. You can use things by nodes. You'll see if you do the labs, 
I have you using showing the labels, and you can select objects by labels. You don't have to use the longer name for it, and you can select them also based off of set-based things, or you can use uh, you know very explicit not equal to or equal to kinds of things in there. You can select things. This is how, for example, a service in Kubernetes selects which pods it's going to talk to on the back end. It selects them by a label. So labels are used throughout Kubernetes. And as we said, deployments are kind of like a pod supervisor. They start spinning up the instances of the pods. And actually what happens is you get, for every deployment, you get the deployment. You get a replica set, which is how many, which is the thing that manages how many are running. And then you get the actual image or actual uh, pod running. So if you were to look at a deployment uh, in there and get all the pieces, you would see the deployment object. Then you get a replica set object with a unique name on the end. You'll see funny looking identifiers on there. That's because Kubernetes has to make them unique. So unique name with the deployment name plus a unique identifier for replica set. The pod name then is the deployment, the replica set, and then the pod name. The pod has an instance of our container running in it. So Kubernetes is spinning this up, making sure we always have the number we asked for. All right, let's look at a couple of animations here to take you through uh, for the last part of the class. So why do we have deployments? Well, it's probably obvious to you already, but let's suppose that I have a, a Kubernetes cluster. I've got a node here, and I've got a namespace in it. And uh, I'm going to spin up some work. I want to create a pod definition. This is just a pod definition. You can spin up pods separate from deployments. Nothing stops you from doing that. Again, same sort of structure, YAML file here. Has an image with a port exposed. And so I say, OK, Kubernetes, I run it through the command line and do a kubectl apply. Whoops, am I going the right way? Nope, no, I wasn't. All right, I'll take that. I'll run it through this. Basically, it would be an apply command. The apply command in Kubernetes takes your manifest, your spec, your YAML file, and feeds it to Kubernetes. So apply or create. More commonly apply, though. Um, pods encompass containers. So it says, hey, you got, a, you got a pod. I got a container in it for you. You told me to expose the traffic to port 8080 on there. Great, you are in business. You say, great, I've got a pod I can work with. Cool. So I can go then and talk to that pod through the port. But what happens if the pod goes away? What happens if it starts using too much memory? Kubernetes kills it off. The container uh, fails. The, uh, my application dies off. Eh, I got to go and apply the pod again. I got to go and apply the manifest, get a new one up, and also got to figure out the address to connect to. But basically, I've got a new pod, but I'll have a different IP address inside there. So I can still get by, but I still have to do something. I still have to keep an eye on it, right? If all of a sudden the communication fails, I have to go see it up. Oh, did something happen to the pod? If it did, let me go tell Kubernetes to spin up a new one. If I have a deployment, then I have my spec deployment with the replica set and the pod definition in it. Then I can go out and say, OK, Kubernetes, give me a deployment with at least one always running of this pod. Kubernetes says, all right, Brent wants a replica set here of one. That means he's got to have one pod running. Here you go, Brent. There you go. You're set. All right, great. Now what happens if something happens to the pod here? Well, I'm still temporarily at a, you know, a pain point, but what happens is Kubernetes is sitting there monitoring, and it says at some point, oops, we, Brent told me I wanted one. He wanted one, and I'm down to zero. So I better go and start up another one for him to make sure I'm up to one. That's what a deployment does for you. Deployment keeps that number running for you in there. So then I can connect up again and start working with it, assuming I figure out the IP address, go back in there. Now, deployments, uh, what this is basically showing, and there's an example of this in that second lab if you want, if you do that, is saying that when we, let's say that I go and have a set of pods running, and then I apply a definition, a new YAML definition that has an updated image, then what Kubernetes does, and this is watching, doing what's called a watch on it, you'll see the pods running. Kubernetes will kill off the existing versions and start up brand new ones based on the new definition that I fed it. So this is just basically showing you this is kind of the way it works for upgrade, right? I can go put in a new image definition 
and then Kubernetes says, all right, oh, Brent's asked for a newer version of this, fine, we're gonna kill off all the containers, all the pods that were running this old one, and we'll spin up new ones in there. Now, again, that's where you get into the whole stateless thing as we've uh, already talked about. Lots of words on here for services. Services basically are with the idea, as we saw, that pods can be volatile. Pods can go away. Something can happen to them. You know, we're not going to run forever. Now, in an operating system, or sorry, in a data center, real data center scenario, you have an operator, right? So that, wait a minute, that thing machines down. Let me go get that, switch it out, so forth. Kubernetes, though, will say, okay, I've got a pod, and depending if you have a deployment or not, may start it again. But pods are volatile. They can go away. They can have issues. When that happens, if I'm connected to that IP address of that pod, because that pod's running my, at my application, if my application can take traffic or serve traffic, if I'm connected to that IP, I've lost, I've lost my connection, right? So then I have to figure out what the new pod's IP address is. What a service does is it gives you one point, a virtual IP, that you can call into, and on the back end, it has a set of pods selected by labels that it can talk to and route traffic to. So even if one of these pods go down, you can still keep in business. The service can still keep going and talking to the pod. If the pod goes down, Kubernetes can start another one up with deployment, and it can be attached to the service, but the service can keep you in business in the meantime. Now, there's nuances to that, of course. I mean, about, you know, if what's, again, the whole stateless thing and stuff, but if your pods are all designed to be able to take over from each other and work that way, uh, it's a pretty smooth process. So without services, getting a little bit more specific, I've got a replica set here, a deployment with two instances. Yes, sir. Just a quick question. Yeah. I guess so. I mean, yeah, depending on, there's different types of services we have in Kubernetes there too. But yeah, I mean, it, it's always going to be it's the same address though for that service coming in, and then it's going to pick the pods on the back end to do that, to translate or to send traffic to. So yeah. yeah. So without a service, we can connect to individual pods, assuming we're allowed to, the port's exposed, we have permissions and so on. I can connect to one on 172.17.022 in this case. And I can talk to it, and again, you know, if the deployment and pod goes, if I go away, we lose access to that pod, or if the pod goes away. So then I could punch in and say, oh, okay, uh, the deployment's going to give me a new one. I can connect over to that one. And then I can go and talk to, I could go and find, say, I know that the 172.17.01 was out there. I knew that one, so I can go connect to that. But if the pod becomes unstable. Unstable, I'm using that slightly differently. Unstable might be it gets into a loop, right? It, does, it stops responding. It's still running, but it stops responding. Either way, it, something happens with it. You can't connect to it. Then you gotta go discover that other IP address and figure out how to connect to it. With a service, the service is basically a pod, def, or is basically a service definition. One of the things it has is it has a selector piece. And the selector is a label. Selector and label. Selector means labels, basically, a way to select labels. Select the ones that have this name raw web, just a key value label on it. The pods themselves have this. So the service says, these are the pods that I can talk to on the back end. I can use these pods. Now, what the service provides for you is a single point where you can kind of come, you can come in and it actually keeps track. It's called endpoint. Kubelet manages this for you. Basically, the endpoints are just the IP addresses of the backend pods. You don't have to know all that, but just kind of showing that it, it, basically the service is keeping a list or keeping based off of the selector, based off of the label, it knows the set of pods that it can talk to. So in this case, if I come in and I am using a node port, I'll talk about node port in just a moment, uh, type of service. There's multiple ports, but I come in through the node. Remember that cube proxy thing I talked about that lets you talk to a node directly? This is you, Node port means a port that's open on the node that I can talk to the Kubernetes node through that, through the server, or talk to the container ultimately through that. So if I connect to that and I send traffic through it and it goes off to this node, or sorry, this pod on the back end and something happens to one of those pods, then I can still 
do my work because the service still connects to a pod on the back end. There's no discovery for me. There's no figuring out what the IP address is. I talk to the service. The service on the back end is what's responsible for managing where it goes, to, which pod it goes to. Now, eventually, of course, the deployment will kick in and say, hey, you're down to zero, you're down to one, you should be at two, I'll spin up another one, here's a new one, but guess what? It'll have a new IP address <laughs> in there. So now, if something happens to that other one, well, the service was still able to pick up the new pod because it had the same label. So it says, I can still talk to that. You don't care, even if it's a brand new pod on the back end just spun up, the service is what's connected to it. So you're connected to the service, Service says, all right, I'll send traffic over there. The other one's become unstable. I'll send traffic over there and go from there. Spec is not shown above, below. It is above, actually. I need to change that. But. So types of services in Kubernetes. You'll hear these terms tossed around. Um, cluster IP. Cluster IP, and the, uh, the diagram here uh, is internal traffic. So this is internal, typically meant to be internal to the... Um, to the, to the cluster, so stuff cluster, right? So cluster IP is an IP that's open inside the cluster for pieces of Kubernetes to talk to each other, the pod services inside of there, not meant for external traffic. Now typically that just has like one port. If this is the uh, namespace and cluster here in the yellow box, then this is just internal traffic that goes in there. And I'm not sure, hmm, I seem to be missing some of the other pieces here showing the cluster uh, box, anyway. No port says I have a port that's open on the node itself, the Kubernetes node. I have a port for the service, and then I have the port that I talk to on the actual pods. So the pod runs your application, right, in the container. The container has a port that's open to talk to. So there's a service port and a, uh, and a uh, pod port, well, in there. The node port just adds another port that is on the node itself. It says, this is not just internal traffic. I want to be able to come in to that machine and talk to stuff through there. Those will have uh, port ranges usually 30,000 to 32,767. There's also a network load balancer. Uh, gives you a formal load balancer in a cloud environment, for example. Uh, usually a cost factor on the clouds but you can put what they call a load balancer in front of it, like in a cloud environment, to do that. That's another type of service. And there's another one called external name, which is about mapping the contents of, of a name field, like uh, the, uh, the network record in there. Uh, I haven't really ever used that one, honestly. But you get the idea. And typically, we'll run into either cluster IP or node port. Uh, node port, if you want to come in from the outside and talk to something on the system, uh, cluster IP, things are just running inside of the cluster. You can also forward ports, forwarding ports. There's a cube, cube CTL port forward command. And you can basically say, I want to forward the port that this is talking to, sorry, uh, um, basically forward it onto a host port. The idea is you can say, I want the port that is in the Kubernetes cluster where this traffic is, like 8089 to be on port 30,000 if I go to it in a web browser on the host machine. So you can forward the traffic from the internal port to the external, uh, to your host machine's browser. All right, so we're getting near the end of our time, but how do we think about this? Going back to our data center analogy. If you want to think about it this way, if it's useful to you, uh, you know, feel free to adopt it, if not, uh, maybe come up with a, a better idea or better uh, approach that works for you. I'm sorry, my slides animation are out of order here, so I'll just go ahead and click through this and get the pieces in here. We can think of a container in a pod as being kind of like a server in a rack in a data center. You have multiple servers usually in a rack. You know, maybe they're all running the same application, running instances of it. So a container in a pod, I'm sorry, a container in a pod could be like an individual server in there. A pod could be like a rack of servers. You've got the rack of servers in there. You've got something that encapsulates them. The deployment, like multiple racks, replicas, right? Replicas out there of doing that. The service, you might think of that like a login server. If you have a login server and it puts you to some system on the back end, same idea with the service. It puts you to some pod on the back end. And then a namespace could be like a server room. You group all the components together, okay? So again, just kind of an analogy for that. 
Uh, basic troubleshooting real quick. kubectl has a describe function, which basically dumps out the contents of a object, gives you the information about the events that are happening in it, the things that have run, what's going on with it. There's also a kubectl logs. The logs command in Kubernetes or kubectl does basically all the logs of the running application. So if I'm running MySQL, it gives me the logs from MySQL. It exposes them out there. You can also do things like streaming logs. You can say, hey, just start streaming out the logs. So these are kind of two of the main tools you get into. Uh, the last thing we'll probably cover, because I think we're going to run out of time. There are other Kubernetes objects we can talk about. Let's talk about RBAC, Role-Based Access Controls. So role-based access controls in Kubernetes, we still need a way to have multiple users, different properties, proper authentication mechanism, controls over which operations can be used, control over which operations inside a pod can execute, you know, limiting visibility and so on. So we do this through a thing called RBAC, role-based access control. Not unique to Kubernetes, but this is Kubernetes version of it. Three types of elements involved. Thing to keep in mind here, Everything in Kubernetes that you'll work with is an object. Everything has a specification. Again, that declarative model. So we have subjects that can be a developer, it could be an admin, a person, or it could be a service account or a process in a pod. We have resources, which are things like the objects, the pod, the deployment, the secret, the config maps. Uh, we haven't talked about some of these. Config maps are basically for holding like environment variables, configuration values that you can use. Secrets are a obfuscated, I'll put it that way. They're hidden, they're base64 encoded. That's about the extent of it. Yeah, but they're at least not in clear text. Way of putting configuration values in there. Anyway, there are various pieces in there, the objects you can work with, and then the verbs, the actions you can get. Get, watch, delete things. These are things you would do in the Kubernetes command line, like get the list of them and so forth. Uh, so the goal is to connect the subjects, the resources, and the verbs. That's what the RBAC process is, and it's how you control access. The mechanisms to do that are Kubernetes roles, Kate's roles. So a role connects an API resource to uh, a verb. So basically, you have the thing like you can delete a pod. The way that I tell people to think about this, it was easier for me, think about this as like a job, a job description. The job description here that can be done is to delete a pod, okay? So I have that job, that role, the role to be filled, right? So then there's a role binding. Role binding says I want to connect a subject, that could be a person, it could be a process and a pod, to the role. Think about that as hiring somebody to do the job. I'm filling the role, right? So I, fill, so I connect up a person now that can do that role. They have access to that role. There's also cluster role and cluster bindings, which are Mm, frowned upon if you don't have to do them because what this means is they have they can do this at any namespace in the cluster it's the global thing any namespace so a cluster role would be maybe to create secrets and the cluster role binding would be to connect subjects to the cluster role so you connect up a person who has then the role of being able to create secrets again think of it almost like a job description the job description is creating secrets in kubernetes Hiring the person, filling the role, the role binding is hiring, is attaching a person or a process to be able to do that. And so uh, these are definitions of a cluster of a role and a role binding. You can see here we have, if, you, know, you probably can't see actually too easily, but there is a definition here, API version, kind role, metadata, rules about what it can do, resources and verbs. Then there's a role binding. And again, kind, API version, metadata, subjects, and a role ref, which simply means which re role are we referring to. So you'll see this kind of thing, config map or secret uh, ref or something like that, you know, referring back to an item. Again, everything in Kubernetes, Kubernetes lives and dies by these manifests. Okay, now you can program to it. You can actually write a program in a language like Go or something like that to interface with it if you wanted to, but by and large you're interacting with it through manifest. So on the cluster side, if we did this, we'd have like the get list and create the role called pod access, which is defined by this spec, would be saying that this role has ability to get list create pods, 
and the role binding would hire a user or attach a user to it to say the user can then do that role. So I could, the user, that means the user could do these operations. They could do a kubectl get pods, get like a list, because we said they have the ability to get this role that we've assigned to them or given to them has the ability to get the list of pods in the test namespace. Uh, and this test namespace is defined in the role binding. We said the namespace this works in is test. They could also, though, go in and do a describe on a pod in there. They could, they, but they could not do a get the pods of another namespace because we've restricted it to that namespace. So that's how you restrict it. Like if you had customers in different ones, obviously you wouldn't want to be able to be, have one customer be able to look at the stuff in another customer's namespace. And you can't do a dash W, which is the watch, which is that streaming things out as they're running. Service accounts are basically what we define for a pod to be able to do a role. We have a service account that we say called my app in there, and then we can go in and add a service account to the pod. So this is hard to read, but essentially what this says, this is part of the pod definition, the pod template, and it says the pod runs under the service account that we defined here. So we define a role, we attach a service account to it in the pod definition, or we, we attach a service account to the role, I should say. We have a cluster role binding here for this cluster role, and it says this role that we define called access uh, endpoint or access EP is then tied to a service account, and then the pod is said to run under the service account. So it's kind of like you give a, so you create an account, service account that the thing can run in, and then you tell the pod to run as that service account in there. And basically this is just showing the kind of the mapping between that. All right, there are extended objects. Um, config maps and secrets are more about configuring data point, basically things like you would have in environment variables. The uh, quick version of that is you define, uh, if you have a set of environment variables, lots of things in Kubernetes when you have a container or a cluster, sorry, when you have a container in Docker, the way they interact with it is through environment variables. They say, if you want to use my MySQL base image, you need to set a password, a database, a stuff as an environment variable. Not very secure, also hard coded into things. So the idea here is simply that we can create a config map or a secret. A secret for the sensitive data that we don't want to be clear text, we can define a secret object. Everything is an object in Kubernetes. API version, kind, secret, metadata. And the data we put in then is a base 64 encoded value. So we define a separate object, a secret, and then we go back and we change our uh, deployment, for example, to say, get the value for these, not from an environment variable, but from a secret key ref, the name MySQL secret that we just defined. So we've externalized, we pulled out that values into a secret object, then we change our objects that need to get that value to say, go get it from the secret. That way I could have multiple things getting the values from the secret. If I change something, I change the secret. May have to restart some things, but I don't have to change every object. I don't have to go and edit every object. Similar idea for config maps. Config maps are just capturing things that aren't secret, that aren't uh, 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 can can be exposed there. But the basic idea is the same. Pull it out. It's just not base 64 encoded. Uh, storage concepts. Kubernetes has persistent volumes. Ways to define storage disk out there, storage areas on the host machine, for example, or on the network or something that you can get to. And then there's an item called a persistent volume claim, which says, hey, Kubernetes, I need a disk that looks like this, this size, has this kind of uh, guarantee for service, that kind of thing. So persistent volume claim is like a claim check for Kubernetes. Kubernetes will try to take a look at the persistent volumes, the external storage it has, and say, you ask for a claim with this mount, this looks like a good fit, and we'll match it up, okay? All right, that's going to get into, and I apologize, we kind of have rushed through that, but I've got to get uh, to a hard stop here for the next part. Uh, this is the labs I mentioned. If you want to grab a picture or a copy of that or whatever, uh, skill repos, not docs, skill repos, K-I-N-T. Uh, if you want to practice what we did in here, play a little bit with it, you get to spin up a little Kubernetes mini-cube cluster individual 
and go from that. Should be fairly easy. Yeah. Is that the link? No, I'll put the slides out. They'll have to get them out there. I was still finishing them up before the class. So I'll get them out there either on the OS 101 or out on SlideShare or something too. Okay, yeah. I'm sure they'll send out a note with references to the slides. I think they usually send out email. Thank you, everybody. I hope it was useful. hope you enjoyed it. I apologize. I'll catch up with you for questions later on if you want, but uh, got to run now. Thank you.